Hello, I'm Satya Chakravarti, a professor of aerospace engineering at IIT Madras uh, at Chennai here in India. Today I'm going to be talking about this topic called accessing space from India. So we live in an information age, which means that we can swap images across the world and uh, exchange uh, things and uh, uh, messages and uh, videos, stream, webcams, everything very quickly all around the world. And so very often we actually come across this term that we are living in a global village. But village life must be boring, right? So imagine about hundreds, well, maybe tens of thousands of years ago, we had the cavemen and women uh, who invented these stone tools and uh, started clearing forests and started tilling the land and did agriculture and pretty soon got into a community and made a village. That village, I don't know if how exciting that is, right? And how is this different from that? So every time you have a situation where you have this complacency that you've actually reached the stage, we need to ask ourselves, is there a way by which we can actually break these boundaries? And <clears throat> when you now hear at this information age, the way to break these boundaries is actually to explore outer space. So imagine that we now have human beings going to Mars. And if you have to say hello to your friend who is in Mars, it's going to take 10 minutes for him or her to hear what you're saying and then respond back. So that's not going to be an instant communication exchange anymore. So we are not in a village anymore. You see what happens as you now keep exploring further and further, you're going to expand out of what, what, what is your village here and then get a broader and broader world. So as people now uh, populate Mars, let's say, and then make Martian cities and, and communities and have airplanes there and so on, and then they became a village out there as well as, of course, along with us on Earth, then the next thing that we need to do is to probably go to uh, the moons of the Jupiter or Saturn or maybe outside the solar system and, and so on. And this process has to go on and on and on for the next hundred or thousand or more years. And that's exactly how human civilization is going to get sustained past this planet. Now if you really think about it, this is about the same time scale that we have for us to actually get out of this planet because this planet is actually fast getting heated up by ourselves. Right? So we, if we want to survive as a human race, it's about time we started seriously thinking about going <coughs> elsewhere uh, to, to find new uh, places. Now the way this started actually was kind of like an accident. Uh, roughly about 60 years ago, we had a very innocuous looking uh, satellite that was put out uh, by the uh, former Soviet Union and then they kicked on a space race. In fact, the way they, they, they did this was also kind of different from what I would like the, the way they should have done. So they had uh, machines like ICBMs and one of them was actually tipped spaceward and they just kicked on the space race. In the next one and a half decades, what happened was a, a space race between the former Soviet Union and the US uh, where they were actually interested in setting a new altitude record. And they just used the same machines again and again without really bothering about if that is actually the right way to go to space in the first place. Right? So along this time in India, we had this uh, new institution that was just beginning called the ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. And even today, people ask the question, you guys can't even manage your own traffic on the road how do you actually manage to send satellites to space? And that's exactly the contrasting thing about India. So back in the 1960s, when Vikram Sarabhai led the uh, ISRO, he was very categorical that he is going to actually make sure India is going to do this only for the <coughs> purpose of uh, serving Indians, and primarily it's going to be an Earth-oriented space program rather than a space exploration going to moon, which was actually the biggest at that time. Now, Vikram Sarabhai unfortunately did not live too long to cherish his dream, 
But I would actually give credit to Satish Dhawan. In fact, if there are any two people that we have to name in ISRO history, it has to be these two gentlemen. Uh, everybody else actually has contributed as a part of a much larger group for every success that has, that has happened in ISRO uh, history in a very orchestrated manner, in a very disciplined manner. But Satish Dhawan, the, the successor to Vikram Sarabhai, is probably the person who actually laid out a blueprint of how we are going to go about without getting into a space race in a very methodical manner, without worrying about what the world is thinking about us, how to get to do what we want to do. Right? So he put together a, a stage by stage program, along with of course his colleagues, where we started with the SLV and the ASLV and then the PSLV and the GSLV and the GSLV Mark III that is happening now. Now the interesting thing about these programs that happened in the early 80s and uh, uh, or through the 80s and the early 90s that is the SLV and the ASLV programs is I would think they were actually well crafted failures so well, I was a school student growing up at that time and it was a ISRO was a butt of jokes because most of these uh, launch vehicles would actually end up in the sea and therefore uh, People did not really understand what is going on. But I think, so in, in hindsight, what it turns out is the ASLV, for example, is a very well-crafted failure because there was a lot of learning that happened where key technologies were tested for doing something that's much bigger in the PSLV. Sure enough, today, PSLV is probably the best uh, launch vehicle on the planet. It has clocked 32 out of 33 successes, 32 consecutive successes, something no other launch vehicle probably has that kind of a record. And so, and, and then you can see that when you're doing something as big as the PSLV, you cannot afford to have failures. Therefore, there was a very, very nice way by which all these failures were planned for a much smaller vehicle. Today, the GSLV Mark III, which actually got launched in December of 2014, uh, also accomplished another um, milestone, which is it was probably one of the very few vehicles that uh, was launched successfully on its maiden attempt. India has been doing extraordinarily well in terms of what its original mission was as set out by Vikram Sarabhai. So Vikram Sarabhai basically said we have to uh, serve Indians with our space program and sure enough there are lots of things that these satellites that are being launched uh, by, by uh, ISRO with the PSLV and the GSLV are doing to us. Communication satellites, Earth observation satellites, um, uh, things like cyclone mapping, for example, the Vishakapatnam cyclone that happened a couple of years ago, the, the number of casualties that got drastically come down because of accurate prediction of the cyclone uh, tracking. So we have the Bhuvan, which is a GIS uh, equivalent of Google Earth. We have the Gagan and the IR, IRNSS the, the uh, GPS uh, satellite constellation that's being launched. So all these things are essentially the same spirit that Vikram Sarabhai fostered. But along the way, India is now beginning to actually have aims at outer space as well. So we are familiar that uh, India launched its Chandrayaan mission to the moon and then the Mangalyaan mission to uh, Mars. And in fact, this is the one that actually gave the big best accolades that uh, India could get. It, it got instant recognition for two reasons. One, the first thing is, it again, similar to the GSLV Mark III, and even before that, the, the Mangalyaan mission actually was a maiden success, which is actually very, very difficult to achieve for a Mars, Mars mission. And uh, <coughs> the second thing, of course, is actually, it was one of the cheapest missions on the planet. In fact, it is the cheapest mission on the planet. In fact, the Prime Minister even uh, pointed out that the a auto rickshaw ride across Ahmedabad on a per kilometer basis were more expensive than the, uh, uh, the ride to Mars that Mangalyaan uh, did. So ISRO now has actually shown the way for how to do frugal engineering when, you, when it comes to interplanetary travel. Because every time when you go to interplanetary travel, there is always this concern. It's going to be very expensive for it. There's a kind of question that everybody asks. And ISRO has actually shown the way that the, the bigger the mission that they would undertake, the more frugal they would get 
do a better job in saving money. And that's exactly what they did with the Mangalyan. As a matter of fact, uh, ISRO has been practicing frugal engineering long before frugal engineering became like a mantra after I put out its nano. So the, the frugal engineering is actually in their gene. However, most of the time, ISRO, like most other satellites, uh, uh, has been spending time around the Earth. Now, if you really think about what is space for us, these are typically only uh, a very, very uh, small region around the Earth where there are these Earth observation satellites and uh, the, the, the orbits that you're talking about are only about a few hundred kilometers. It's kind of like the distance from here to Bangalore or Bombay, except that it is actually going skyward, so it is actually a lot more difficult and, 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 and you know uh, that it is, right? But the real space is actually out there. So in, this, in today's world, for example, ISRO, this in 2016, is lining up about one launch a month, 12 launches in 2016. That's a huge amount of change that has happened in ISRO culture when compared to what happened uh, barely a few years ago. So the question basically is, why are we actually spending so much time doing more, more and more around the Earth? Why can't we actually go further out? So my suggestion, or my, my point essentially is, that ISRO has this roadmap towards a lot of other things that they should be doing than just these PSLV and GSLV launches. And they, they have uh, the manned space vehicle, the, the reusable launch vehicle, the uh, single stage to orbit vehicle, all these things lined up for the next 10 years. And they need to be focusing more and more on those and probably set up a corporation that would do the routine launches on a monthly basis and focus on these. It's, as a matter of fact, ISRO should probably set up a, uh, or foster a startup culture on space startups where uh, innovative ideas on space can come up. Startups have to actually be frugal by uh, necessity and ISRO can actually part with their organizational experience on being frugal uh, and, and uh, also bring in big business to uh, invest in these. So these are uh, things that they can actually do to take care of the immediate access to space, to the space orbit for smaller payloads that they have been doing. What they need to be doing probably instead is to take the lead and put out an international consortium where they can now say, I have a 20 year, 30 year plan to go to Mars and occupy Mars and colonize it and settle uh, Mars with human exploration and uh, human habitation. And this is something obviously uh, a single government or a single country cannot do. It has to be done globally and it is important to do it globally because we take humanity along. This is all about sustaining humanity uh, uh, for the rest of uh, posterity. And therefore we have to have a collaborative effort uh, but ISRO is actually well suited to do this because they are one of the most active space programs in the world and they are the most frugal space, space program in the world and they are probably the best to do, to, suited to now lead the uh, show on a Mars, a Mars program, a human Mars program. So if you now think about that, is it, is it going to be too expensive? Is it going to be very unaffordable for a country like India? Probably not. In about 20 to 25 years, we are probably going to be the second largest economy in the world, uh, next to China, and uh, we will be the most populous country in the world, and we will be representing one-fourth of humanity. So it's about time we started thinking like a leader and stop being a follower. So I would basically suggest that we have to have a uh, inkling towards going to uh, interplanetary space exploration for the purpose of humankind, and let's do it with India. Thank you very much.